the first thing that I have to do is um, I've written on my notes Mia Kolpa on Rep SL2. Um, so I stated a theorem on the classification of the module categories over SL over representations of SL2 that was completely wrong. Um, so the way that this was discovered was um, Anna really liked the um, the statement of the theorem, wanted to understand it a bit, and in particular wanted to explain it at Macquarie. And so we were trying to reconstruct the proof that I gave and fill in the gaps. And we were having enormous difficulty at one point, which is arguing that, um, so, remember we started with a rep SL2C module. M, and then we associated to this a graph with vertices, um, ISO classes of simples. And edges um, if W occurs as a sum and of the natural module acting on B. And then um, I stated totally incorrectly that um, this graph is necessarily an affine simply laced Dinka diagram. Um, so for some reason, I'd, I'd remembered that not only the statement and uh, I remembered not only hearing the statement and the proof from Ostrick. And so when I, um, when we couldn't re reconstruct this step, I wrote to Ostrick and then Ostrick wrote back and said, I've got no idea where you had that, that idea from. That's totally wrong. It's only true for the, um, for the modules over the Belinda, um, the categorifications of Belinda algebras. So, um, these tensor categories associated to um, quantum groups at roots of one. Okay. So there, the statement that I gave is correct. Here, it's totally incorrect. So just as an example that you can even do by hand is that this graph occurs with any, with n bigger than or equal to two loops occurs. And, um, Ostrich also commented in his extremely helpful emails that he doesn't really know any way for representations of SL2 to categorize these nice ones that happen to come from Dinkin diagrams. So my apologies for that. And um, I guess the notes will be fixed up with the discussion of the Valinda um, case if you're um, interested, but they haven't been fixed yet. Uh, are there any questions based on this? I know this was rather fast. What what graphs do occur then? Like uh, so, as far as I can understand, it's it's an open problem. Oh. Um. So. For ex so, what you can do is um, consider these graphs, and you can look at their frobenius peron eigenvector an eigenvalue. And basically the ADE Dinkin diagrams correspond to this eigenvalue being two, which is the dimension of the natural representation. And I spent about two hours with Anna trying to find a general argument why this eigenvalue is always two. And I was convinced that it should be. Um, but it turns out that this is just totally false. And for example, Ostrich stated that the classification problem for when this eigenvalue is three is totally unknown. Sorry. So it's re related to difficult questions in graph theory, which are currently unsolved. So I um, didn't quite follow what is the um, problem whose solution we know and what is the problem whose solution we don't know. So. Um, do we know the classification? So we don't know the classification of SL2 modules in general. Exactly. So rep SL2C modules.
up to equivalence is unknown. But now for any, for any L, there is, um, there is a tensor category Ver L with um, objects. So this is a finite braided tensor category with objects triv V0 up to V um, L minus one, I guess. Hmm. So the growth and the group, there is a tensor category for Linda of L. And it's growth and group is isomorphic to rep SL2 modulo um, the class of the highest weight, the modulo the class of the simple highest weight of highest weight L. So it has. L simple objects and um, and module categories. So ver L module categories for all L correspond to ADE Dinkin diagrams. So if this follow-up question detracts from your lecture today, you can just dismiss it to later. I mean, postpone it to later discussions. Uh -huh. But um, my impression was that ver L was supposed to be the category of um, level L, sort of the level L fusion category with fusion product. Mm -hmm. So are you mm -hmm. claiming that that tensor product is the same as SL2C tensor products, modulo L? Um, I mean, so this is built out of, this is built out of the quantum group. This is built using UQSL2. And then the correspondence is via this casualistic isomorphism between the quantum group and with its, as a braided tensor category and the affine Lie algebra with its fusion product. Well, thanks. So that was, uh, I mean, that was a false statement that I had, that I thought was true for about four years. Um, okay, so I just want to recall, uh, so basically this lecture will be on um, de-equivariantization and equivariantization. And I want to get to the first kind of really beautiful observation that I guess is Roman, is, is Bezrakavikov's observation. Um, and so there's a fair bit to get through, but I think it's worth it and very, very nice mathematics. Um, so last time, so this is basically the, today we're doing um, D equivariantization. So what I want to do is take the statement from last time. So we have Y and algebraic stack. And so what we saw last time is that a, a sheaf of abelian on Y, I stated a theorem that says that this is the same thing as a vect Y module. 
Um, so I, a um, category with action of the tensor category of vector bundles on Y. Okay. And there were some assumptions. And, <clears throat> and I don't want to dwell on this too long because I want to get through, I want to get through this, um, this lecture, but the kind of most important example is if G is linear algebraic, and y is point mod g, then we can think about why. So it's very useful, in my opinion, to take the, this point of view that Emily taught me, which is to think about this stack. So this has, this is the, um, this is the stackification. Of point mod G triv, which sends any test scheme to, so this has objects um, trivial G bundles. Okay, so S, any test scheme goes just to G times S. And because any principal G bundle is locally trivial, the stackification of this pre-stack, so this is a pre-stack, the stackification is point mod G, the classifying space for G bundles. And the beautiful thing about this pre-stack is it's very easy to understand. Namely, um, we associate every test scheme S, a single point, and its endomorphisms are the S points of G. So another, so as groupoids, this sends S to a point with endomorphisms G of S. Namely, these are precisely the um, automorphisms of the trivial G bundle on S. Okay. So the reason that this is so nice is, for example, imagine that I want to give a coherent sheaf on this pre-stack. This just means I have to give a whole lot of trivial bundles together with actions of G of S. And this is exactly what it means to give an algebraic representation. And similarly, so what is this side? This is a, um, this assigns S to an abelian category. Action. And this side is just a, so, Vector bundles on point mod G are the same thing as representations of G. So this is just the same thing as a rep G module. Okay, so these two notions are equivalent. Okay. And um, Today, I want to give a simple example of this phenomenon, which is equivariantization and deequivariantization for um, modules over finite groups. And in my notes, I've written, this should have come first. And my apologies for that. Um, the reason it didn't come first was I, so during this whole trying to work out what's going on with this um, rep of SL2, I found a reference in this book of um, Eddinghoff um, 
Galaki Nistic and Ostrich to a, a fantastic paper that cleared up things a lot for me. And so that's what I'm explaining in the first half today. So basically what we want to go, what we want to move between is categories with a group action and categories with an action of representations of G. So if that all made no sense, don't worry. Now it becomes much more concrete. So simple example of this phenomenon. And this paper that I just found really, really enlightening. So reference is this paper DGNO, which is Drinfeld, Galaki, Ostrich, and it's called On Braided Fusion Categories. Section four. I would be very happy if I could write as clearly as this section four is written. Um, so always, so simple example of this phenomena, so we take G, a finite group. And here I need to be a tiny bit careful with, uh, so in the discussion last week, we were kind of assuming that all inductive limits existed. Here, I'm kind of taking a more smaller point of view following this DGNO. And so we consider rep GF, so this is finite dimensional representations inside rep G, which is all representations. And we work in the setting is K linear additive Caribbean categories. Okay, so we're no longer in the setting of abelian categories. And also we don't assume things like existence of inductive limits. Um, Recall that a category is Caribbean if every item float and splits. Okay, so if you have something in an endomorphism ring that looks like a projector, then it is a projector. So what is this phenomenon in this simple example? So it is, uh, there's a process of going from K linear categories with G action. So remember, I've covered this notion before we've discussed this in some detail. This means that for every element of G, I'm given an equivalence. And moreover, these equivalences satisfy the, 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 so this is a strict action. So I don't just have an isomorphism class of every equivalent of, uh, um, of equivalence for every element of G. I've really got a functor determined up to unique isomorphism for every element of G. So, and over here we have um, K linear categories with an action of finite dimensional representations. And the claim is that there's two arrows here, which are basically equivalences of, so this is called equivariantization. And this is called de-equivariantization. Um, and the theorem is that 
equi-variantization and de-equivariantization are mutually mutually inverse equivalences. If you want to be fancy, it's of two categories. Okay. But there's a canonical procedure from starting with the G action to produce a rep G module and starting with the rep G module to produce a category with G action and these are inverse equivalences. Um, and so the, the passage from here to here is kind of very easy and very, this is basically passage to equivariant objects. The passage back is a little bit more mysterious and somehow this, the relationship between these two sides is um, greatly clarified by embedding them both inside rep G enriched um, K, -line K linear categories. So there's a process. So one way of seeing this equivalence is that this is the proper object you should look at, and then there's ways ways of producing these objects out of things here. Okay. So let's first just discuss verbally an example, which I'll write down later properly. Imagine that G acts on some variety or scheme, then G also acts on its category of coherent sheaves. And equivariantization, and so that produces a thing over here. Equivariantization is basically something like taking G fixed points, so it produces G equivariant coherent sheaves here. And de equivariantization is a process by which, starting from G equivariant coherent sheaves, you can produce ordinary coherent sheaves. And here, this would be the statement that if I have some sheaf with an equivariant structure, then homomorphisms between such sheaves can be viewed as modules over representations of G, i.e., homomorphisms are G representations such that taking fixed points gives me precisely the morphisms of equivariant sheaves. Okay. So now I'll give more details on this. And yeah, I mean, if I'm entirely honest, probably the best use of your time would just be to read the four pages in <laughs> DGNO um, at this point, but um, I'll continue the lecture anyway. Okay, so I first want to discuss the equivariantization error, and then I want to discuss the de-equivariantization error. So we have G acting on M. So this is an additive monoidal, sorry, just an additive K linear category, Caribbean. So we have equivalences FG of M and we have mu G H morphisms from FG FH to FGH, etc. Okay, this is, we've discussed this before, this is the notion of a strict group action on, an, on a category. And an equivariant object is a tuple 
consisting of an object. So this is an object in M and UG is an isomorphism from acting by G on M and M itself um, such that a diagram commutes. So what's this diagram? How would we guess it? Well, we'd start writing down by start writing down FG FH of M. And now there's two ways to identify this with M. Namely, we can first take FG UH, and this gives us an isomorphism with FG of M. And then we can use our UG isomorphism to identify the bits with M. Or we can use our action isomorphism to identify this with F G H M and then use our U G H isomorphism. This commutes. And um, a morphism of equivariant objects is a morphism. So a morphism from M U G to M prime U G prime is a morphism from M to M prime commuting with the UGs. Okay, so I have some F here and I can act on F. Uh, what am I doing? Oh yeah, this is just UG prime. Um, and a very nice, so remember that G is a finite group. Is that if G acts on X a scheme, then um, the first very nice exercise, which I should have posed at some earlier point, is that G acts strictly on um, coherent sheaves on M, on X. And then the second part of the ex exercise, so that's part one, the second part of the exercise is that if I take coherent sheaves, so this gives a category MG, which is the equivariantization. And if I take the equivariantization of coherent sheaves, I get precisely the G equivariant coherent sheaves. Okay. Are there any questions on this bit? Okay, I think this is extremely natural. Uh, so an important remark is to notice that the equivariantization is a module for rep G. So remark
So if I have x inside here and v inside here, then v tends to x makes sense as an object. So this is, so I have x together with And I claim it has a canonical equivariant structure. So the claim is that there's a canonical structure, namely I want to define, so I want to define a map. Uh, can I ask a stupid question? Yes. Uh, so, so what is a V tensor X as an object? So um, there's two ways of saying that. I mean, the preface is always, this is not a stupid question. Um, so there's two ways of saying this. The first way is just to say that um, if we choose a basis for X, Let's, you know, this is a finite dimensional vector space, so, so we can choose a, sorry, basis for V, this is a finite dimensional vector space, we can choose a basis for it. Um, and we just take that many copies of X. Okay. The problem is that, and, and then you can convince yourself that this doesn't depend on choices. Another way of saying it is that this, um, that the functor of, so the functor that sends, um, Home that sends y to home to v tensor home y. Sorry. So the other way of saying it is that this functor is representable by an object which is called v tensor x. Okay, this, this functor represents. Okay, which is a nice way of convincing yourself that this um, ad hoc definition we gave earlier um, is in fact canonical. So Josh has a comment. So that's a very good question. Um, so Josh asks, is there a way to recover G equivalent cheese for an arbitrary topological group, not just a finite one? Um, so the answer for a linear algebraic group is yes. And it's basically this, the same thing. And the answer, I guess, for a general topological group is yes, but you have to work a whole lot more in um, in some appropriate kind of homotopic homotopy theoretic sense. Um, we can discuss this at a lunch lunch or something like that. Uh, so there's a so v tensor x is canonically isomorphic to v tensor f of g x and here i can use so this is a representation and so i have a map rho from g to or to v and i use rho g tensor u g and this takes me to v tensor X. So that's equivariantization. And so what we just saw is that this 
is a rep G module. Now we come to deequivalentization. So uh, A is the regular representation of G. So this is the functions from G to K. And this is a, um, so if this has a left G action, So F G of F and this has a right G action and this is an algebra in rep finite G for the left action. And so it's a, if we consider the right action, then it's a G equivariant algebra in rep F G. So. So now if N is a rep G module, we define N lower script G. So this is the D equivariantization. to be the A modules in N. So what's that? So we've gone over this notion before. I'll just re recall you what it is. So this is N. This is um, pairs A in A, where this is an object inside N, and A is a map from A tensor N to N such that blah. Okay, such that it's a, it's a module over A. And note that because um, as G If I have a module over an algebra that has some automorphism, then I can twist a module by that automorphism. And that's all I'm doing here. So deequivariantization takes a rep G module and produces a uh, category with action of G. And an, a really nice example of this, which is enlightening, at least for me, So it's a, it's a little bit difficult because we're used to thinking about modules over, over algebras in vector spaces. So it's a little bit difficult to think about what a module is over a, um, 
over an algebra in a monodal category. Um, so let's just see an example. So if we take n to be g equivariant sheaves, on some scheme X. So remember G is a finite group. So the, the claim is that kind of looking at modules over A, over KG, so A is KG, inside this category produces a kind of miraculous way of recovering ordinary sheaves on X. And why is that? So, um, so NG is kind of A modules Koji X. And this is the same thing as so when we act by A on the unit, we get OX of G, the kind of regular representation with values in the group algebra. And this is the same thing as what, what I'm think. This is the same thing as um, co g of g times x. I'm thinking that I have this affine morphism. Okay, so modules over an algebra down here over the direct image of, so modules over the structure sheaf, so coherent sheaves up here are the same thing as modules over the direct image of this structure sheaf down here by a principle that we've also discussed several times before. And so the same is true of equivariant sheaves. And so this becomes G equivariant sheaves on G times X, which is just the same thing as coherent sheaves on X. And note that, of course, we have an action of G here. So now I want to discuss, so these are the two arrows of equivariantization and deequivariantization. Now I want to discuss the third point of view, which is uh, rep G enhancements. So I'll go over this and then we'll um, have a break. So we, I want to explain how in both settings we can produce an, an enhancement via rep G. So if G acts on M and um, M and M prime are G equivariant objects, so the claim is that G acts naturally on the homomorphisms in M from M to M prime. And the homomorphisms of G equivariant objects are simply the fixed points. So this is very familiar from coherent sheaves that if I have two G coherent sheaves with a G equivariant structure, then their homes as normal coherent sheaves 
are a G module and the equivariant homs are the fixed points. Maybe um, in the interest of time, I'll leave this as an exercise. How to go the other way is a little bit more tricky. Um, so suppose that rep G acts on N. Then um, for X, Y in N, we can consider the functor The functor from rep G to um, vector spaces, which sends V to HOM V tensor X Y. Okay, so this is a semi simple category. And any additive functor on a semi simple category is representable. So any So this implies that this, this functor here is represented by some object HOM XY in representations of G. And now this representation may not be finite dimensional anymore. So i.e. we have that um, HOM from V to HOM X, Y is home from V tensor X, Y. Okay, and note that we can recover our category from this enriched category um, if we plug in V to be the trivial representation here, then we simply get that the invariance inside this space is the homs in, um, so the homs in N from X to Y is simply the invariance in this home space. So let me uh, just try to draw a picture of what's going on um, uh, and then we'll have a break. Um, So the following is an attempt at a picture. So the first passage was from the action to the equivariantization. And we can factor this passage in the following way. So Um, so how do we kind of think about G acting on M? So M has certain objects and certain morphisms. And then what G does is it might, um, it moves these objects around, it moves some of them around and it fixes some of them. 
And we have to be very careful because the statement that G fixes an object, um, we can ask is um, G of X equal to X? And that's not a good question to ask. So we should still ask, we should instead ask is G X isomorphic to X? And then when we ask that, we shouldn't um, settle for that. We should say, can we give canonical isomorphisms? I, can we get an equivariant? Can we provide an equivariant structure? So then inside, kind of inside, but not really inside, we have the um, objects with equivariant structure. Okay, so, and one should imagine here that these are canonically fixed by G. And so G just acts on morphisms. Okay, so here G moves objects and morphisms around. Here G fixes objects. Moves morphisms. And then by taking fixed points, I get um, MG. So this is the only the objects, so equivariant objects. plus morphisms fixed by G. And it's kind of surprising. So each time we go from here to here, we, we cut down the sides of things. And it's kind of surprising that we can go back. So given N, we build out this, um, we build this rep G enrichment. Okay, and that's rather easy to imagine. I think that the it's it's just kind of the fact that if you know um, the invariance in any for for an action of a um, of rep G, kind of knowing the invariance is enough if you have the tensor product. So we can we can go back up and construct this picture, and then um, and then the other slightly surprising statement is that the non-equivariant objects are consequences of the equivariant non-equivariant objects. Consequences of the equivariant ones. Okay. And just a remark is that um, this point here, is not so surprising for a finite group G. As um, any X is a sum and of the direct sum of FG of X. And this has a canonical. So this is called the induction functor of X, and this has a canonical equivariant structure. Okay. So I, I, hope that, I hope that this picture kind of helps understand how to go back and how to think about this. Jordi, mm -hmm. so this last step, so to go, okay, so we, the functor one way, the easy way, you just take a category and take the equivariant objects. Mm -hmm. And so th there's nothing mysterious there, but I'm still trying to understand that the opposite way to construct the functor in the inverse. So do we need the entire, like all categories with G actions or do we just, can we just work with one? I mean, somehow in this explanation you gave at the end, um, okay, how to say this? 
I mean, so this explanation at the end is not a pictorial explanation, right? This decovalentization. I mean, pictorially, there is no way for me to see how I can take a bunch of points with G acting on each other separately to recreate a G set or a G. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess it's difficult. Like, I, it's difficult for me to draw a picture of a rep FG action. Like, well, like th somehow the the action of a category of representations is kind of of a linear algebraic nature. Uh huh. What. Right. So, uh, so that's the point somehow is that this being k-linear here is very important, right? I mean, if it was just sub on some arbitrary category, it's hard to imagine. Exactly. Like it's hard to imagine that this is just being complete abstract nonsense, right? It's, um, there's something is required there. Yeah, the, the linearity is absolutely essential. And as I, I mean, really one can think about this as being like, Yeah, like this, this passage to a rep FG module is like global sections. So in this dictionary we had before, we had a, a sheaf on, a sheaf of categories on point mod G. And then we have a rep G module. And this you can really think about as being kind of global sections. And this appears to be the unique level of categorical complexity at which this global sections is an equivalence. So if we look at this for um, the case of ordinary sheep, so this is a sheaf of cats. So if we look at vector spaces on point mod G, the same thing as representations of G, and it's definitely not true there that taking invariants, i.e. taking global sections, is enough to recover your representation. And also, Gatesbury's long paper on the notion of one-hour fineness is about the, the, the very subtle, the, the extreme subtlety of this arrow when you go to higher categories. All right, well, thanks. So I guess, yeah, I mean, from just a naive point of view, we all know what is an equivariant uh, object when G acts on a set, but the equivariantization doesn't exist really at that level, or maybe it exists but doesn't give you anything useful. Yes. Um, Can I ask another stupid question? Uh, if you don't say stupid question, if you say, Can I ask a question? you can ask a question. Okay, can you go up a little bit? So I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the definition. Um, no, uh, where you define the D, uh, the D equal, equal <laughs> so that thing, so, um, <laughs> D equivariantization, yeah. So I, so, so I don't know why an, an, an G is, uh, G, mo G module category. So, uh, so, so uh, for, no, for no, example, so, it's, so NG is not a module over rep. G, but yeah. G acts on NG. Yeah, I just want to know what this, this action is. Ah, so um, G acts via automorphisms of A. And so given, a, given an A module, I can produce a new one by twisting by the automorphism of A corresponding to G. So you mean uh, uh, object? So for example, given an uh, 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 element in G, uh, for example G, I want to uh, define an object in NG called FGN. Uh, exactly. And uh, what you want to say is that as, as an object in M, where uh, 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 in N, uh, it, it is still the same thing with N, but the 
uh, we twisted the A action on it. Perfect. Okay, thanks.
So I really want to get something extremely nice. Um, let's see if I do. So we, we see the first, if I'm lucky, by the end of the lecture today, we see the first really beautiful um, observation that makes Archipov Bezor Kavnikov work. Uh, so, D, so now I go back to, um, so the back, to, we, so the hope is that the previous discussion made you slightly less scared of equivariantization and deequivariantization. Um, and the previous lecture covering um, Gatesbury's paper is basically this idea um, souped up. And as I understand it, um, this equivariantization, deequivariantization emerged so at some point in the 70s, perhaps um, associated to the mind of Drinfeld, but I don't know. Um, so the, this is called, I want to call this, ah, so back to the setting of linear algebraic H. H. And so some of the statements that I will need will need things like incompletions and like in, incomplete and things like this. So now the deequivariantization principle is it answers the question of how to make some abelian category C linear over S mod H, where this is an affine scheme. equal to spec A, and this is linear algebraic. So the example that I hope to get to is G mod G, really beautiful example. Uh, and the principle is oh and the other thing is that um, I will start writing um, instead of n g I'll write n d equivariantize so this is Bezel Kavnikov's notation and because a lot of what we're doing is based on Ezra Kravnikov at the moment, um, from now on, I'll follow his notation more closely. Uh, so the principle is that in order to do this, it's enough to give um, A rep H module structure on C and two is a um, an H equivariant um, A linear. structure on the deequivariantization with respect to the H action. So here's another attempt at a big diagram. We have a very important Cartesian square point mod H, S mod H, point 
and S. So this is Cartesian. And now, so what is this saying? So let's, let's say this data is the red data. So this is saying that we want to give, um, we want to make C live over here. And we want C to live over, so, so that's one. That data is saying that C is living over point mod H. And now what's the deequivalentization? It's the pullback to a point. So here's the deequivalentization here. And as we've discussed, H acts on this. And now the statement is that this is what we want up here. We want C to live over here. And it's enough to have um, C de-equivariantized live um, H equivariantly over S. Okay, so of course to, live, to lift um, C de-equivariantized de up to S, it's just enough to give an A-linear structure. And in order for it to live G-equivariantly here, we need it to be um, Okay, and so this is the data two here. Okay, so what does this actually mean in practice? Are there any, pic are there any uh, questions concerning this picture? So, In practice, we can um, simplify this a little bit um, at the expense of comprehensibility. Um, so we can make it much more concrete, the data that we need to give, but it's much less clear why we're giving this data. And I just want to do that briefly. Um, so we have our rep H module C. And remember that C D equivariantized is the same thing as O H modules. So here I need, so remember that um, O H is an end object in rep H. Okay, so if I, if I have enough um, completeness, then it makes sense to tensor with OH, and I'm tacitly assuming that I have enough such completeness. So o OH modules, and we have a functor from C to C de-equivariantized, which sends an object X to OH tensor X. An exercise, OH tensor is left a joint to the forgetful functor from C D equivariantized. If I have a an OH module, I can forget that it's an OH module. So what does this tell me in practice? So um, it means that HOM in 
um, CD equivariantized from between two between two things of this form So, um, yeah, so all I'm saying is that um, often what we'll end up giving is an alinear structure here. Um, so, to give an H equivariant alinear structure is the same thing as giving an a linear structure Okay, so maybe don't worry about this too much at this stage, but um, later on we'll see things like this coming up a lot. And um, one can think about these home spaces as just being um, hands on manifestation of de equivalentization. Okay. okay. So now I want to give a simple and I think really beautiful example of this, of this de equivalentization principle. So how to give So this is the kind of one of the simplest examples that you could come up with. Um, and what I want to explain is that um, this is some quite manageable combinatorial data that you can provide on a category, which means that it's a sheaf over this quotient stack. So the de-equivariantization principle implies that we need to give two things. So we need a category. We need um, a rep G, a rep GM. I mean, I'll just say we need a rep GM module C. And this is this is freely represent this is freely generated. So the category of representations of GM is freely generated as a tensor category by the natural representation. This is freely. natural representation that I'll denote nat. So this is the same thing as um, an auto equivalence
m goes to which I'll denote m shifted by one, which by definition is just the what happens when I act by the natural representation on m. So if I know how the natural representation acts, then I can um, know how any representation acts because any representation is a direct sum of um, tensor powers of the natural representation. And uh, the second point that I would like is a, an O of A1 equals K of X linear structure on the deequivalentization. And what's the deequivalentization in this case? So HOM between two objects um, in the deequivalentization of K of O G M tensored M O G M tensored M by the principle that I just explained by this adjointness, this is the same thing as just HOM in C from M to, and remember that this is just K X X inverse. So this is a direct sum of nat tensor power M for M in Z. And so this is HOM So this is just home. So what we want to give, so this is a, this is a graded module, a graded vector space. And we want to give um, IE a kx um, graded module structure on this. And, um, and cooking this down a little bit further, so what do we want? We want m, we want M, sorry, C, our equivalence, M goes to M1, and together with um, X, which is a morphism of functors from the identity to And the point of this example, is that uh, so a category over a1 times g gm so this is kind of like somewhat geometric i mean it lives in the world of coherent sheaves etc whereas this data here oops This data here is somewhat combinatorial. And a repeated theme in, um, in the, uh, the arguments in Akipov Bezrakavnikov and also in uh, Bezrakavnikov are to distill some coherent sheaf data into some reasonably combinatorial structures that can then be found on the side of constructible sheaves. And just to continue this example a little, so a very worthwhile exercise
so the claim is that to give a category over um, over A1 mod GM is the same as giving this data. So we have our C moving over A1 mod GM. Now there's various interesting stacks or schemes that mod that, that map to A1 mod GM. So for example, there's A1. There's also zero mod GM. And there's also GM mod GM, which is the same thing as a point. There's also zero mapping here. And the worthwhile exercise is, so we have C living over here. And the exercise is to compute the pullback in terms of the above data. Okay, so when we pull back to here, we should get a category with action of GM. So it's pretty clear that's gonna correspond just to this. It's reasonably clear that pulling back here is just gonna be forgetting this and remembering this. Um, this is probably the most interesting one. So it's really worthwhile thinking about to get used to this. This should just return a normal category, etc. Questions? Okay, so this was a small fish that was reasonably easy to handle. And now we go after a bigger fish, which is um, what is a sheaf of categories on the Lie algebra mod G for the adjoint action. So um, the de-equivalentization principle implies that this is the same thing as a rep G module C plus Um, an OG linear a G equivariant OG linear structure on but uh In principle, this could be, still be a pain in the neck to give. And a key observation which is one of the first kind of really key beautiful things that happens in this story, so I'm assuming this is due to Bezra Kavnikov, I have no idea, is that Tanaki and formalism This bit, 
So the complicated bit of data in some sense as an endomorphism. As a certain tensor endomorphism, which I'll go into now. And so it's rather remarkable in the sense that it gives um, structure on this reasonably complicated stack. Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot going on here geometrically, um, but there's a combinatorial description that's rather simple. So I just briefly want to recall um, Tanakian formalism to what I need of it. So this is nothing like a um, complete review, but we take G a group scheme over. Over K and we have the forgetful functor from rep G to K. And now we can consider um, a K group functor. I a functor from affine K schemes to groups that sends A to the tensor automorphisms of the forgetful functor tensored with A. So what does this mean? I.e. The, um, the set of um, so tensor automorphism. So this means that it's an automorphism of the, so for all, for all representations V, we get a we get an a linear map here, a linear automorphism. And the remarkable thing is that if we require these automorphisms to be compatible with the tensor structure on G, then they necessarily come from G. Um, so this is saying such that the following diagram commutes. So we can tensor And now this is canonically isomorphic to V tensor V prime tensor A. And so here we have such that this commutes. And then the theorem that I need is that G is isomorphic to this K group functor. So to give an A point of G is the same thing as to give a tensor endomorphism of the forgetful functor, the extension of the forgetful functor to A. And I guess, so there's no way that one can digest this um, given what I've said. Um, but what you can kind of think is that like, elements of G obviously give such. So um, A points of G, so the kind of slogan is that A points of G
So let's forget about A in this diagram up here and just say we want maps from V tends to V prime such that this diagram commutes. So any element of G satisfies action by Elliot, any element of G satisfies such a requirement by the rule of how we define tensor product on representations. So A points of G obviously satisfy this requirement. And so we definitely get a map from G of A to Oort tensor. And the miracle is that this is everything. I this arrow is an ISO. And there's various ways of thinking about why it is an isomorphism, but I don't want to go into those at the moment. Uh, so one question you may or may not have posed yourself is how do you recover the Lie algebra of G from Tanakhian formalism. So in order to answer this, we have the following definition. A tensor endomorphism of um, of four tensor A of the forgetful fa functor tensor A NV, so this is an endomorphism of the forgetful functor for every representation of G, such that the same diagram commutes, but we kind of pass from groups to Lie algebras. So NV tensor one plus one tensor in B prime. So we take the same diagram as before, except we replace the kind of automorphism condition with the Lie algebra condition. Um, and just a stupid remark is that a tensor automorphism is not the same thing as an invertible tensor endomorphism. And now the theorem, which is how to recover the Lie algebra from Tanakian formalism, is that G tensor A is isomorphic to the tensor endomorphisms of the forgetful functor. And uh, so, I just want to remark that because uh, G is linear, um, it's enough to know kind of G tensor K, um, but the A points version um, I mean, you might be mystified why I'm worrying about this A here in a linear situation, but that should become clear in a second. And a nice little exercise
So let's call this theorem group. And this theorem Lee. So theorem group uh, deduce theorem Lee from theorem group um, using that we can describe the Lie algebra of G as the kernel of the map from the points over the dual numbers to the K points. And there's a, I, I don't know, I find it really nice if you just plug this statement into Tanaki formalism, this pops straight out. So great. So, Thank you, Peter M. For me, epsilon always squares to zero. Uh, so now, uh, here we come to startling consequence for me. And then I'll finish. Okay, so just remember, in the, the endomorphisms of um, the tensor endomorphisms of the forgetful functor is the Lie algebra. So the rather startling consequence So I wanted to get to this this week so that you have one week to digest it um, and then we'll go into more detail next week. Oh, and by the way, um, there's a wonderful challenge on at the moment, which is that if you can tell me where my background is, you get to give an IFS talk on the topic of your choice. Okay, so amazing prizes are available today. Um, and the competition closes at the end of this, um, at the end of the discussion session after this lecture. So the rather startling consequence is the following. So if we consider tensor endomorphism, So A is an algebra, is a K algebra. Tensor endomorphisms of V goes to V tensor A, and V is a representation of G. This is the same thing as an element. So what Tanakian formalism, so this is um, Tanakian. So it tells us that there's obvious tensor endomorphisms given by actions of action of the Lie algebra. And what Tanakian formalism tells us is that this is all. So this is the same thing as an element inside G tensor A. But we can rephrase this as a homomorphism just by dualizing G dual into A. So this is a homomorphism of, of vector spaces. And this is the same thing as a homomorphism OG to A of algebras. Okay, and remember when we wanted to apl apply the de-equivariantization principle, we wanted to get a homomorphism, a G-equivariant homomorphism. And in order to do so, we just um, add G everywhere. So I have G acting on A, the K-algebra. So G-equivariant tensor endomorphisms. 
are the same thing as a G invariant element here is the same thing as a G equivariant homomorphism here is the same thing as a G equivariant homomorphism here. And so this is the same thing as a map from A mod G to G mod G. So the moral is, is that to kind of make something live over G, the Lie algebra mod G, it's enough to give a tensor functor from representations together with some endomorphism, endomorphism of this tensor functor. Um, and we'll see more detail on this next time. Thank you, Tony.